Okay, so now we're at chapter 10, and it's the last chapter of the term. So good for you if you've gotten this far. All right, so now we're going to talk about accounting for long-term liabilities. And so first thing we want to talk about is bonds and bond financing. And so what are bonds? Well, it's kind of like, uh, well, it's a, a liability, obviously. It's a long-term liability, but it has some um, characteristics of stock. And so oftentimes what we're talking about, bonds can be issued by uh, companies as well as governmental agencies. Uh, here we're talking about uh, bonds issued by corporations. And so um, what you have here when you issue a bond or a corporation issues a bond, they issue these bonds at a certain face value. Uh, usually it's in denominations of $1,000 dollars, sometimes five, but I think mostly for our purposes we'll be doing a thousand uh, dollar bonds in our examples and hopefully our uh, problems that we work. And what this bond allows is for investors to receive uh, payments on the bond, interest payments, usually those interest payments are semi-annually, so every six months, and at the end of the period, the maturity date of the bond, the corporation pays the investor the face value of the bond. So, uh, you know, if you've got a, like a five-year bond, um, during that five-year period, the investor receives semi-annual payments of interest, whatever the stated interest rate is, and then at the end of that five-year period, let's say it's a $1,000 bond, uh, on <clears throat> the maturity date, um, the investor's going to receive, of course, their last uh, interest payment as well as the face value of the bond, $1,000. Well, what's the advantage of bond financing? Well, uh, bonds are debt, so you don't have to include these investors that buy the bonds as owners of the corporation so they're not shareholders, and so they don't have any control over what the company does. They don't have a vote, voting interest like a, a, a common shareholder would, common stock holder. Um, interest on bonds is tax deductible, so they get to deduct it off their tax as an expense which reduces the amount of taxes they pay to the government, lowering their, lowering their overall um, marginal tax rate or average tax rate. Uh, bonds can increase the return on equity, which current shareholders certainly uh, enjoy. Some disadvantages are that uh, you got to pay the obligation. You've got to pay semi-annual interest, and you got to pay back the face value of the bond at maturity. And sometimes the bonds can decrease return on equity, and so. When the company earns a lower return with the borrowed funds than it pays in interest, it decreases the return on equity. So, uh, since it's a debt, uh, you know, sometimes 
when you see a project that you want to do, you think the return is going to be this. Let's say you think it's going to be 12%. So you go out and incur debt of 6%, uh, you know, expecting to have that spread there of 4%. And then once you start the project, you find that the project only has a return of 2%, but you're paying 4%. So that would be a case where uh, you'd have a decrease in return on equity. Now, bonds are kind of a hybrid in that they're sold and purchased in securities markets just like stock. And so they have a market value that's expressed and this market value is expressed as a percentage of their par value. And so if you have a $1,000 bond and the closing price, let's say, is at 103.08% of face value, that means that this bond is going to sell at $1,030.80. As far as bond issuing procedures, uh, when you buy a bond, the corporation's going to issue you a, a bond certificate or a bond indenture similar to what you see here. It's a little out of focus, but it's so better in the book. And so, you know, it has details concerning <clears throat> this particular bond. All right, let's talk about uh, the entries that you're going to make to record interest issuance or the bond issuance and interest expense. And so here we're issuing the bonds at par, which means that the stated rate of interest and the market rate of interest are exactly the same. Okay. Now we'll look at when when the state of the stated rate of interest is different from the market rate here in a minute. But right now uh, we start with this because it's much easier to start with this to comprehend what's going on. All right, so here we have a par value of $100,000, which probably is equal to $100. $1,000 bonds, but whatever. And so we issue those uh, bonds. We're going to recognize uh, $100,000 of cash. And of course, our credit's going to be to bonds payable. Okay, so this is on December 31 of 2017. You're going to have interest payments due semi-annually, so at 6.30 of 2018 and 12.31 of 2018, you're going to have payments, semi-annual payments made. Also in 2019 at those dates, you're going to have semi-annual payments of interest as well. So note here that you could do this a couple of different ways. You could take the, the stated rate of interest and simply multiply it or take half of the stated rate of interest and multiply it by the face value. And so you could go 100,000 times 4%, or as they've done here, you could just simply go 100,000 times the stated rate times one half year. It, it doesn't matter. You come up with the same number, in this case, $4,000. And so you make this entry every six months until the bonds mature. Now on December 31, this shows the entry you're going to make when the bonds mature. 
but you're actually going to have two entries that you're going to make. You're going to be paying interest expense of $4,000. That's your last interest payment on the bond. And you're going, so, you know, technically it would be uh, interest expense 4000 bonds payable 100000 and your cash that you would pay would be uh, 104000 actually, but you could make those two separate journal entries as well, and this would be the, the second part to that journal entry, dealing with the bonds payable, backing it out and paying the cash. All right, so again, market rate and <clears throat> the stated rate of interest can be different. Sometimes the contract rate is going to be more than the market rate. Now, you have to put your thinking cap on here. If the contract rate is more than the market rate, the contract rate is, say, 12%, and the market is paying 10%, uh, potential, potential investors, investors. What, are, are they going to want that? that? Is that desirable or non-desirable? Well, well, it's, it's going to be desirable. desirable. And so, so potential, potential investors, investors are willing to pay a premium over the face value of the bond to receive 12% rather than 10%. So they're willing to pay more for the bond. Well, what if the contract rate is less than the market rate. Uh, the contract rate is 8% when the market's 10%. Well, in order to attract investors, you're going to have to uh, sell the bond at a discount. And so the contract rate stays the same and the corporation, in order to attract investors in the case of a discount, or, you know, if they're selling it at a premium, they're not going to have a problem attracting investors since it's more than the market rate. So they're going to actually have more, more potential investors than they have bonds. They're going to pay the same amount of interest. In our example before, it would be $4,000 of interest. But they're receiving either more or less than the face value of the bond. So the bottom line is that the, 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 the corporation adjusts the market rate to be the same as the contract rate through the amount they charge for the bond. So let's look at how they they do that. And, and of course, if contract rate equals market rate, as we saw, the bond would sell at par. All right, so let's say we have a discount. We sell $100,000 worth of bonds at the... Um, quoted price on on the market at 0.965 excuse me 96.454 the reason why is because the market rate what a potential investor could get out in the market right now is 10% and our stated interest rate on the bond is only 8% so we're going to have to sell the bond for less than its face value in order to attract uh potential investors. So again, look how we're, we're adjusting to the market. We're adjusting by lowering the face value of our bond so that the investors getting the equivalent of 10% return. All right, so 
We're going to sell this at 96, 4, 4, 4, 4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4, $4
when, when you're going to report the this bond on your balance sheet as a liability, you're going to list it as a long-term liability since it's payable over two years. And you're going to list the uh, face value here, $100,000. And below it, you're going to list the discount on bonds payable. And so the difference between the two is called the carrying value. And my point earlier is that you've got to amortize the discount so that at the end of the contract period, two years, the carrying value is the same as the face value of the bond. So as of 12-31-2017, the carrying value is 96000 454 and so you're you're amortizing this discount 887 per uh, pay period and so note that a discount amortization is actually increasing the carrying value Now, here they calculate uh, the bond interest for each period using the total interest payments plus the discount. Uh, you come up with the same numbers. So every six months, bond interest expense, 4887 Discount on bonds payable, 887. The, the cash paid, 4,000. Okay, let's look at a bond premium. Here, the stated interest rate, it's the same exact example, except the stated interest rate is uh, greater than the market rate, so it's selling at a premium. And here, the issue price is 103,546, meaning uh, they're receiving $103,546 in cash for a bond that has a face value of $100,000. And so the difference is called the premium on bond payable, and they call this a an adjunct liability account because it is in the credit column, not the debit column, like uh, discount was, bond discount. And so here you're going to have uh, negative amortization. <laughs> Uh, occurring and so it's the same deal 3546 is the total amount of the premium just like we saw with the discount and so here you're just you're going to have to do negative amortization over the the four payment periods and so that's going to be the same deal, they're still going to pay um, $4,000 of cash as a credit, and they're going to debit a premium on bonds payable, 887, which means that the bond interest expense is going to be uh, actually a lower amount
Okay, so $100,000 stated interest rate here is 12%, so you're paying 6%. So it is different because you're going to pay 6% each uh, term. So instead of 4000 it's 6000 um, So I stand corrected. And so notice that uh, the amount of cash you're paying is 6000 The debit to premium on bonds payable is still going to be 887 And so your bond interest expense is going to be the difference, which is going to be 5113 So notice that the uh, interest expense is less than the actual amount of cash that's going out each period and again at the end of the period the carrying value needs to be the same as the face value of the bond here the carrying value is more than the face value of the bond it's 103546 and you need to get it down to <clears throat> par value of 100,000, and you're going to do that by uh, amortizing this 3546 at 887, debiting 887 per period. Okay. So that's, that's it for bonds. bonds. That's, that's about, about as hard as it gets, gets folks. In this class, anyway. All right, All right we're, we're not going to talk about retirement of bonds, bonds so let's, let's move, move on to note payable. And, and again, you've, you've already seen, seen this sort of thing, thing but uh, here, um, you're, again, you're paying principal and interest. Usually, you're paying um, installment payments as well. You know, if it's a single payment of principal of plus interest, it's pretty simple. You've kind of already dealt with that. But usually, if you have a note payable long term, you're going to be paying installment payments or regular payments each month. Here, they make it a li little easier. Um, you got a situation where there's three payments each year for three years. So they borrow $60,000 from a bank to purchase equipment. They sign an 8% installment note requiring three annual payments of principal plus interest. And so, um, again, this is probably beyond the scope of this particular course, but to figure out your payment, you would have to go to what's called present value tables and figure out the present value factor for this note at 8% interest and just kind of follow along if you will if you knew how to do this <clears throat> you would find out that the present value of um, $60,000 at 8% is 23,282 dollars and so what that means is that you're going to pay $23,282 every year for three years. So anyway, the bottom line is you're going to record this installment note. You, you receive cash and you're going to record a credit to notes payable. So that's your initial entry. And then every year, you're going to record your interest expense and 
what's, what's left, left over of the payment, payment is a reduction of principal. And so that first year, after that first year, you've paid 23282 and 23282 is broken up into interest expense and the principal amount owed on the note payable. And so the interest expense is simply the 8% interest rate times the beginning balance, the beginning of the year balance. And at the beginning of year one, it's the $60,000. So take $60,000 times 8% and you come up with interest expense of $4,800. Now in column C, that is determined by simply taking the amount of the payment, 23282 and subtracting the $4,800 interest expense for that period. And so that difference is 18482 And so that's the principal uh, amount that reduces the payment or the, the note. And so you take the 60,000 beginning balance, beginning in year one, in this case, subtract 18,482, and you come up with a balance at the end of year one of 41,518. That's also your beginning balance for year two. So in year two, when you're figuring out your interest expense, you're going to multiply 41,518, the, the beginning balance for year two, the, that's the principal amount owed at the beginning of year two. And so you're gonna calculate your interest expense based upon the amount of principal owed in year two. So 41,518 times 8% is 3,321. You're paying cash of 23,282. So the difference between the interest expense and the amount of cash paid is the reduction in the principal amount of the note, that being 19,961. And so that reduces you take the 19,961, uh, you subtract that from uh, the beginning of the year balance at the beginning of year two, 41,518, and at the end of year two, your principal amount owed is 21,557. And so that's your beginning balance in year three. You multiply that times 8% to get your uh, interest expense for year three. And since you're paying 23,282, uh, the difference is going to reduction of principal, which is exactly, uh, makes your principal amount owed at the end of year three exactly zero. So note, when you're making installment payments at the beginning of the payment periods, you're paying more interest expense, and it reduces as you go along, and you're paying more principal farther along in the note you go, and less interest. And so here, here would be your entries for each year Interest expense, $4,800 that first year. Note payable is the difference between the, the interest expense and the cash outlay. And you have your entry for two year two. And of course, you would have your entry for year three as well. All right, I think that's it. All right, so that's chapter 10. Hope you enjoyed the course and uh, good luck. Hope to see you in the future.